Oh, shalom, my friends. Shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, dancing and being freilach with you on this Saturday morning, Shabbos. It is February 26, 2022, and we are excited and delighted to be dancing along with our guest in the neighborhood. Her name is Liza Gennaro. She has had an extraordinary career in theater, as I, I do it with the three syllables, theater and dance. For example, she choreographed the Broadway revival of Once Upon a Mattress, starring Sarah Jessica Parker. She did a, a Music Man years ago with Dick Van Dyke. We have him, we actually have him with us. Oh, he, he's, he's not in the best of shape, but he's with us in the neighborhood. And most importantly at the moment, she is an authoress. She has a new book called Making Broadway Dance from the Hoo 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 Oxford University Press, who, which quote, and I will quote, examines choreography for musical theater by a dance studies, script analysis, movement research, and oh, if I tell you I got movement this morning, and dramaturgical inquiry, won't you welcome please also the daughter of the man who co-choreographed the original West Side Story. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Shalom to Liza Gennaro. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, so, so great to see you. Thank you for joining us. So tell us, tell us, tell us the first question you always get asked. So you've been doing what you've been doing for so long. Why now to write a book? Are you going for a full professor or something? Or what, what's the deal? Uh, no, I'm actually not going for a full professor. I'm currently the dean at the Manhattan School of Music uh, running their musical theater program. Um, and I how long? you know, career as a dancer first, then as a choreographer. And I went directly from high school. I went to the professional children's school. And from there, I continued my professional career. So I didn't go to college until considerably later. So when I was in getting my undergrad and then graduate degree, particularly my graduate degree in dance studies, I was noticing that there was really no scholarly interrogation of musical theater dance. It was kind of the ugly stepsister of the dance studies world. It was considered disposable and kitsch and a monolith. And I thought, well, with my history and my passion for the form, I should write a book. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> well, and also, I mean, so many different angles to go with on this because of course you're the daughter of Peter Gennaro and you've done it yourself and you've been teaching it so I mean do you talk about Laban choreography or is that a little too arcane and all that so I mean what do you what is your angle is it historical or are you more like this is why this dance works in Oklahoma uh-huh a little of both. Um, it's, it is historical. I start in um, the 1920s looking at dance training, looking at the um, development of jazz dance on Broadway, um, and looking at methodologies and showing that prior to Agnes DeMille, who's always touted as the first moment of narrative dance on Broadway, that in fact choreographers and dance directors were looking at narrative much earlier than DeMille. So oh, they, that they were putting the grist before DeMille. <laughs> I'm sorry, please continue. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of mythology around musical theater dance because it was never really looked at seriously. There's, there's a lot of pronouncements about what it is and uh, how, what the trajectory and history was. So it was really digging into those different statements such as DeMille created the dream ballet when in fact the dream ballet had occurred several times before DeMille um, and and really unpacking what was actually the truth of actually what was happening and retrieving some of the artists who due to being women or due to being black were erased from the um, historic record. So, so if you were to, to, to be asked like who was were one or two of the most important or innovative choreographers pre DeMille. Yeah. Whom would you point to? Yeah. Well, if you start with the 20s, um, with let's say Shuffle Along, those early black choreographers were essential to the development of musical theater dance. And names that you just simply don't know Herbie Harper and Lawrence Diaz and many more who were on productions 
and then removed from productions and replaced by white choreographers. And they were either paid off or sometimes they were simply assistants. George Balanchine, the famous and wonderful ballet choreographer, George Balanchine, who had an extensive career on Broadway before he created, as he was forming New York City Ballet, he always used a black choreographer Tapper who would assist him on productions and who did, you know, a huge majority of the choreography. So the appropriation aspect of what those choreographers did was really missing from the history. So that's one thing that I looked at. Then there were other choreographers, Seymour Felix, um, I talk about quite a bit, who really was looking at shows in terms of, from a dramaturgical perspective, how could dance um, further the narrative and just serve as a narrative tool on these musicals. That was long before DeMille, that was also in the 20s. And uh, Balanchine as well also um, brought narrative content to the dances. So by the time you get to DeMille, there's a lot of precedence for what she did. But then what DeMille does is gives us female perspective and she's really she's always creating dances that are about women and about what women experience in life in many different aspects she often also works autobiographically in her dances and she approaches the dances from the outside in so she often has a perspective or an agenda that she wants to state through the dances. And she does that by her brilliant ability to insert her ideas into the libretto, which then enhances the libretto while at the same time gets her point across. So the dream ballet in Oklahoma is a great example of that. Well, this makes me ask, since you choreographed all over the country and on Broadway, so do you have an agenda when you that is goes through all your work, not just one particular show. What's yours? <clears throat> well, I'm certainly a feminist, so I've always tried to bring a um, female perspective as well to my dances. Um, but the the other side of the paradigm of musical theater dance methodology is Jerome Robbins, and Jerome Robbins worked on the musicals really from the inside out. So he didn't have so much of an agenda. His agenda was how to make dances that fit organically into the libretto, into the script. And I was really trained more in that school than in DeMille's school. So I'm more of a integrated choreographer in that I'm making dances that look I'm trying, my goal is to make dances that look like they're being created in the moment by the people at the time, place, and uh, to enhance the characters. Now, now so, it's it's uh, surprising to me, haha, that you would be a Jerome Robbins person. Gee, did, was, your, was your dad uh, at all in any way? Uh, did he know Jerome Robbins at all? Extremely well, he knew Jerome Robbins. Um, my my father worked on several shows with Robbins um, prior to West Side Story. He was in Steam Heat, um, which was, of course was choreographed by Bob Fosse, but a show that Robbins was also on, um, that's Pajama Game. Also Bells Are Ringing um, and a few other shows. And then through his relationship with Robbins, Robbins was looking for a, uh, he, he was not wanting to choreograph West Side Story and he went to Hal Prince and said, I'm going to direct the show, but it's too much for me to direct and choreograph. So Ro Hal Prince said, well, I'm not producing it if you don't choreograph it. So Robbins said, well, then I have to get a, uh, I have to have a team of assistants. So he started to gather his assistants and he went to my father and said, you know, would you be interested in assisting me on West Side Story? And my father said, well, I don't really want to assist you, but I would co-choreograph it. And Robbins agreed. Um, then went on to make a very specific contract, um, which basically gave entire ownership of everything my father did to Jerome Robbins. So from then on, my, my father made his initial fee for the show, but he never had any kind of royalty payments and crediting 
my brother, who is an attorney, has spent many, many years making sure that my father gets credit on all the revivals. So, so and, and is your father credit, you know, Spielberg directed a West Side Story movie last year. Is your dad's name on there? He actually is. He's actually listed in the credit, which was very generous. He, uh, that certainly didn't have to happen, I don't think. So it was. it's a very nice that that did happen. What did you think? I have not seen the movie. Well, I'm sure you have. You know what? I haven't seen it yet. I'm going on Tuesday. I just got my tickets. Uh, oh, okay. My tickets last night. I, um, I've been so busy at school that I just haven't had an opportunity to see it yet. So, Kay, did your father tell you stories of working on West Side Story, working with, or on, on any Robin's show, but certainly story. I mean, we know the one where they made the Jets and the Sharks hang each other as, as actors and then, you know, so they could get that yeah. one we kind of know. But what inside stories may your yeah. father have told about all these experiences? Yeah. Well, Robin, my father had a good relationship with Robbins. Um, they had a very good working professional relationship. Um, I think Robbins truly valued my father and valued what he brought to the production, which was a very different kind of dancing than Robbins was familiar with. Robbins was a ballet and modern dancer primarily. My father was studied with at the Catherine Dunham School and had an enormous amount of training in the Af dances of the African diaspora. So it was, and my father was from New Orleans and was primarily, I would say, a jazz dancer. So um, he, he brought a very interesting perspective and that really did make a difference in terms of identifying the two gangs, the Jets and the Sharks. Um, so that's why my father was there. My father did have a very good relationship with Robbins, but I think part of the reason they had such a good relationship was because my father didn't really, in a very kind of, um, not an obvious way, he really didn't tolerate being bullied. And Robbins is, you know, was a bully. And, you know, it's not, I'm not telling tales out of school. Everyone knows that Robbins was a bully. That's how he worked. Um, and there was one meeting that my father told me about that they were about to go out of town to Washington to work on the show pre-Broadway. And he had Robbins called all of his assistants. He had this big team of assistants, including a co-choreographer, my father, brought them all together in the room and really was yelling at them all and giving them a hard time and saying, you, when you get to Washington, you got to be there for me. And when I say jump, you jump and carried on. And at the end of the meeting, my father went up to him and said, Jerry, that meeting that you just gave, you didn't mean me, did you? And Robin said, oh, no, no, Peter, I didn't mean you. So my father would kind of confront him in this very kind of like, what's going on here way. And I think Robin's respected that. And as with any bully, when you confront them, they normally do back down. So um, he had those kind of stories. Can I ask how much of your dad's work were you able to attend in person and mm -hmm. see growing up? Yeah, um, well... The Broadway shows, um, less so, uh, because when he was doing, he, he was in and out of Broadway because he did so much television work, um, the variety shows. And that was a weekly occurrence um, on Ed Sullivan, Perry Como, Craft Musical, Judy Garland show. I mean, he was just on tons and tons of those on a weekly basis. So that work, I had a very close relationship with and I've seen so, so much of it. The musicals, less so, um, certainly Annie, you know, uh, by the time Annie was in the late 70s, and I saw, you know, dozens and dozens of times. But shows like Fiorello, which were earlier, The Unsinkable Molly Brown, which were earlier, I don't have memories of having seen those live. The Unsinkable Molly Brown, my father did do the film. So I did see the film. Um, and right? when you watch The Unsinkable Molly Brown, do, do you see your dad's touch? Really yes, nice. absolutely. I can even tell, I mean, you know, obviously I do have a developed eye for note for dance, but I can tell even if there are clips, like every now and then YouTube, you know, some crazy clip will come up of Mitzi Gaynor or somebody, and I can tell if my father choreographed it even without the credit, because I understand his movement vocabulary and his humor. 
And um, you can really see, you can see that in the dances. And that's true. I, I'm pretty good at identifying pretty much any, certainly musical theater choreographer and some and ballet pretty good too. And have you choreographed, I'm sure you must have, it's a limited canon. Uh, have you choreographed shows that your dad, have you had to say to yourself, oh no, this is my dad. I gotta be different for me. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did a production of Fiorello at Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera. Um, and it was really interesting because you look at the dance arrangements, which are created with the choreographer and the dance arranger, and you're looking at the music and you're building the number and they're like maps, you know, they really tell you what to do. And I found with the with Fiorello, it, it was just very, very familiar to me. And I just sort of knew how to do it. And then the kinds of numbers that are in Fiorello were very kind of easy numbers for me um, because I know I knew the vocabularies. Um, that also can be true, though, of Robbins. I mean, Robbins shows, I've done Gypsy a few times, and they're not fun for a choreographer, unless you've got new dance arrangements, because he was so specific with his dance arrangements and how the numbers are built that you kind of trapped. You sort of have to just do what it was. Um, so it is an interesting process. There aren't a lot of big chorus numbers in Gypsy. It's just basically Tulsa it's, dance and that's it, right? Or, well, it's the kids' numbers, which are uh, very hard to do. The vaudeville numbers are really They always hard. made me the back of the cow. I'm always, <laughs> always not going to be the back of the cow. We are talking, by the way, with the delightful Liza Gennaro about her life, her career, her new book. It's called Making Broadway Dance from Oxford University Press. Get it wherever books and presses are sold. Let me ask you, Liza, so, so you're directing on Broadway, right? And you're directing regionally everywhere. And yet you, at some point, must have made the decision, I want, uh, I, I'm not going to say safe, but I want a career. You, you went into academia long time ago. Why that? As opposed to, oh, I think I'll direct here for three three months and here for a month and then go here and make a living that way. Yeah, yeah. I well, I started teaching very early. Um, I was in the American Dance Machine, which was a company devoted to the recreation of Broadway showstoppers. Um, I joined the company in the late seventies. There's now a new version of the company, but of course I was in the original company. Um, and Lee Theodore, who was the original anybody's on Broadway and West Side Story ran the company and she was a great teacher and it was a great experience for me. Uh, we learned enormous amount of wonderful Broadway rep and she very early on when I was probably about 19 would have me sub for her class teaching when she was out. And from there, I just kind of kept teaching. It was always kind of a go-to for me when I wasn't doing a show. And I ended up getting a position at Hofstra University before I even had a degree. And I kind of liked the academic thing. And it was really the, also the beginning of my looking at musical theater dance in a very specific way and really educating myself on what that form was and educating myself on dance generally. Of course, I'd been raised seeing lots and lots of dance and Broadway, but um, I really delved into the history at New York Public Library for the Performing Arts, you know, as a very young person. So, um, from Hofstra, I then got a position, I was still choreographing and dancing, but I then got a position at Barnard, I worked a bit at Princeton, I just kind of was bopping around as an adjunct at Marymount, Manhattan, um, and I had a daughter, had a child, and reached a point in my life where the hopping around and then the running out of town for, you know, six weeks to choreograph a show became just difficult for me. And so I decided to see if I could really get into an academic position. By then I had gotten my graduate degree and I um, applied to uh, Indiana University, had a position come up and I ended up going out there for six years um, and living out there. Um, taught in the program and then ended up heading the program before the Manhattan School of Music job came up and then I was I was ready to get back to New York City. <laughs> Here's the question, now you, you're a dean, you know? Yes. So is, is all your day essentially 
paperwork? Is it student complaints? Is it Title IX? I mean, do, do you have anything to do with actual <laughs> dancing and teaching anymore? It's a good, very, very good question. It is all of those things that you just mentioned, but I also do choreograph um, on the shows. You know, for we do we produce seven shows a see a year. It's a lot of shows. Good um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I'm usually on one or two of those choreographing. Um, so I do do that, um, and I still have some outside gigs, um, that I do, of course, with the pandemic, they've not been happening, but I have a yearly production of a Charlie Brown Christmas that I did in San Francisco Symphony. Um, so I have a few, you know, things like that, that kind of keep, keep that part of my brain alive and working. How long does it take, like, when you have to go do up a new because it's not going to be the same exact actors it's not it may not be this probably the same sets but you go back to do charlie brown christmas in san francisco is does it take you a week does it take you a month how long to to whip all this into a it is a new show sort of sort of i mean with the way it's worked out in san francisco is that we've had the same dancers most not all the same dancers but many of the same dancers repeat and then I have a fantastic assistant named Elena Zalman, who did the show with me when we originally did it for the New York Pops in New York. And so she is the one with, you know, the assistants and the associates in Broadway and regional theaters. They are the unsung heroes because they're the ones that have the Bibles of the shows and they really do the recreation. So she puts that show together in about a week. Yeah. Wow, I, it's just mind I can't even memorize a sentence in a week when I'm doing my, my theater shows. My God, and it's good. Let me, here's an idiot question, because not everybody who watches this program, Dave's gone by, knows dance as a theater person. Lens. So I'm always, what, what is the difference between a choreographer and a dance captain? Okay. So the choreographer is the person who is hired part of the creative team and who works closely with the composer, lyricist, book writer, director to create the show, to create the dances that end up in the show and to work with the cast. The, I'll give you the hierarchy. The next step down is the associate choreographer. And the associate is a person who can stand in for the choreographer if the choreographer is not there. So if the choreographer has to go out of town, this the associate can step in. If the show has a tour, ends up having a, it's a Broadway run and then has a tour, the associate often puts the tour together. So they're very, very important. The assistant is sort of the next step. The assistant, sometimes there's not an associate, sometimes there's a, only an assistant, but the assistant works very closely with the choreographer, works with the cast in terms of teaching things when needed, cleaning numbers when needed. And then the next person is the dance captain. And the dance captain is the person who stays with the show. So if I go to the Guthrie and do a show out at the Guthrie when I leave, the dance captain now preserves my work. So on Broadway, <clears throat> shows like Aladdin and Hamilton and Wicked, it's the dance captains who Well, are... they have on Broadway, right. the associate usually is the, the dance captain is still there and taking notes regularly on the show, but the associate will also be going in to do replacement auditions or whatever needs to be done. So they're kind of dividing and conquering. But on the regional show, there's usually not an associate. You usually have an assistant who is often the dance captain. And then the assistant assists you while you're there and then you leave and then the dance, then they shift hats to the dance captain and they take over the running of the show. Now, can I ask you, Liza Gennaro, in all your years, whatever it would be, what is your, like, your favorite assignment? What was like the best experience you've ever had choreographing a show? Well, I've had a few. I've had a lot of bad experiences, but I've had a few good ones. <laughs> we'll go there. Oh, go. I want to hear those too, but tell me I'll the go, best. I'll go to the good ones first. Yeah. Um, well, Charlie Brown Christmas, certainly for one, was a very much a favorite of mine. I like what I did, and I'm happy that it's been successful. The Most Happy Fellow, which was directed by Gerald Gutierrez, started at Goodspeed Opera House and then came into New York. That was, that was, a, the, was that the piano one? The two pianos. Yeah, yeah. That was a wonderful experience. Everybody on that show was working at the height of their powers. And, you know, Jerry was in great form on that show. Um, and that was a that was a lovely experience. 
Um, and then I did a show with um, Stephen Flaherty and Frank Galati called um, Loving Repeating, a musical of Gertrude Stein. We did it in Chicago. It was Stephen Flaherty setting Gertrude Stein writings to music. And it was about her relationship with Alice B. Toklas. And it was a beautiful, beautiful show. Um, and I had a wonderful experience working with them. That was a great time. Okay. All right. You brought it up. So, <laughs> you don't have to name names, although probably if they did. But what are like the, the, what are the experience like, oh my God, I'm getting out of this business. I'm going to go sell Carmel. What? Tell me. Well, when the sh when shows, you know, shows can misfire for lots of different reasons. Um, a director can be mismatched to a production. A, a choreographer can be mismatched to a production. Casting can be off. Um, things can just go wrong very early on, and once they do, they're really hard to recover. And I've been on a few of those, unfortunately. And I guess the one that I could talk about it mostly was Smile, which I was a um, I was the assistant chore I was the assistant choreographer, dance captain, and emergency swing. On, um, smile. Now this, let, let me uh, preface this. Let me tell people that Smile was based on a very funny satirical movie. That was, it was Michael Ritchie, I think, did, did direct the movie. And all about beauty pageants and then the behind-the-scenes wrangling that was going on. So who gets involved in this? Composer Marvin Hamlish. I, I, I'm forgetting some of the other people. But this was going to be a big Broadway musical, almost instant pre-sold hit, considering who was involved. I mean, it was Beauty Pad, a perfect milieu for a musical. Yeah. What went wrong? So uh, Howard Ashman, it was Howard Ashman and Marvin Hamlish. And we did a workshop first. Um, and, and Howard also directed. And that's a lot of hats to wear. Um, he also hadn't worked very much. I loved Howard but he hadn't worked very much on big, big, big shows like that. So I think it was also a new experience for him and a new experience to have wearing all those hats. Um, we did the workshop first. We did it at West Beth, uh, West Beth. Um, and it was a big, big success, that workshop. It was very dark, like the film was. Of course, it was a blank stage. It was, you know, Mary Kite choreographed it. She did these fabulous, you know, creations of space through bodies and using chairs. So she choreographed and you were? Assistant. What? Oh, so, okay, got it. Okay. Assistant, the dance captain, and the um, emergency swing. If it was today, now with the advent of associates, I probably just would have been the associate. Uh, but back then, they kind of blend, bundled all those roles. Um, so we did the workshop. It was great. It was dark. Um, it had a not a happy ending. Um, it had the, all the cynicism of the movie. Um, and it went very well. And we got picked up right away. And off we went to Broadway. And we, pre, um, we had previews and um, tryouts in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, I think. We, no, Baltimore. Baltimore we were. Um, and we got into the theater and suddenly we were in Barbie's dream house and it was all pinks and blues and the set was immense and it had all of these towers that moved and it was a spectacular set but what the workshop had been and then what the set and the the way they kind of heightened it to be a Broadway show uh, in my personal opinion, I just felt it was a mismatch. And once that happened, there was no turning back because the set was enormous. There was an incredible set of costumes by William Ivy Long um, that worked beautifully with the set. But the story, I think, got lost. And while the cast was fantastic and there was so much good to that show, it just never quite recovered. Um, from, I think, what was maybe just a, I, I think they just made, simply made a mistake in how they conceived it for the Broadway stage. And at that time, what was it, like 85? 
I don't think audiences then were not particularly interested in cynicism. Um, so I think that they were trying to get away. I think the producers must have pressured them to get away from the cynicism of it and make it a happy ending. And um, that just... Although this was, at least when you say that this was a, a bad experience, if you will, it was about mismatching. It wasn't conflict. It wasn't untalented people. It wasn't wrong no. decisions. It wasn't a terrible, oh my God. It was just, it just you saw the set yeah. and you knew... Uh oh, and and you can't throw out a four million dollar set because the producers yeah. didn't pay for it, right? Yeah. So there it, it was an excellent set. It was an excellent set, an excellent designer. It just didn't work for the show. Ultimately, it was my feeling, my personal feeling. No. So, and then when that happens on a show, you know, everybody starts turning on each other, and everybody's looking for the scapegoat, and you know, it just gets ugly. And it's very, very unfortunate because all everybody wants is for the show to be a hit. <laughs> Let me ask so. you, uh, uh, since you mentioned that you were a swing, so at that point you were still dancing and doing stuff, um, where do you come down? I mean, I think she took a little, almost too much flack, but the, the, the head of the League of American, well, no, they call it the, the Broadway League now, um, Charlotte St. Martin got into all this hot water by just trying to tell people, you know, when, when Mr. and Mrs. Omelsky come from Idaho to see a Broadway show, they're hoping to see the star, the, 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 the co-star, and like the actual quote unquote cast, not a bunch of people who've been also rehearsed, but they were second choice, no, you know, whatever. And then and not a bunch of folks who haven't been day after day, week after week doing the stuff. They're thrown in, they're kind of like in the same clothes as the lead. So they're cast almost to fit the same body type as the leads and so and, and suddenly all the swings and all the the dancers and all the chorus people jumped on her for for denigrating swings and, and where do you where do you stand on that whole controversy if you will well the swings and understudies and covers are essential to broadway and they are spectacular performers it is such a hard job and they always cover cover multiple tracks so they're covering many people in the ensemble many you know more than one principal often uh they usually often on broadway they do have their own set of costumes um so even even in regional theaters they do so the body type thing is not quite as essential as it used to be um and they you know I have this at school. We do, we have a swing program at school. So on all of our shows, we do cast swings, understudies and covers so that they have that experience because it's a great, you know, it, it just makes you that much more castable if you know how to do that and keep you working. And I work very hard on making sure the under, the students understand it's not a secondary position. It's a hard position. You have to sit on the side. You have to be invisible until you suddenly have to step in and take over a role. It's a really hard job and it really requires. There are people who absolutely love doing it. There are people who do it, try it out and decide, you know what? It's not for me. I don't like sitting in the dressing room when the show's happening and thinking, oh, maybe I have to go on at any second. Some people can't handle it. And some people love the variety. You go on for a different person all the time. I think it's very wrong to think that the show is lessened by a cover or an understudy. I think that they are, they are proficient, fantastic performers who are rehearsed continually and are filling in at a moment's notice and do a really difficult job with a lot, enormous amount of skill. So, you know, I, I do have a problem with saying that that's um that you're seeing something lesser you're not now speaking of let's get back to a star thing because you did choreograph a, a, a revival of the music man you know, it's on Broadway. I, didn't not, not the one that's, yeah. I didn't choreograph it i was in it you were in it you were in it with with <laughs> Do you have any stories about Dick Van Dyke or just in that experience of, of the music man? Well, let me first say Michael Kidd choreographed it. Michael Kidd, who had choreographed, people might know Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, the movie, but he also had extensive, he did choreograph Guys and Dolls and many other Broadway shows. Um, Dick Van Dyke was a lovely man. Uh, he, he kept to himself. Yeah, he didn't, 
we didn't see like a lot of him socially. Uh, he would attend parties. He was always very polite and very nice. Um, I didn't have, I wouldn't say I had much of a relationship with him other than, you know, hi, how are you? Nice to see you <laughs> and stay okay. on stage. Um, Meg Bussert was our Marion. She was fantastic. Um, she's a friend. Um, and it was a lovely production. They were both excellent in it. What did you learn from being choreographed by Michael Kidd? You know, Michael Kidd was tough, um, but not abusive. Well, I mean, all choreographers during from that golden age of musical were a little bit abusive. <laughs> I'll say that. They're tough. You know, they, they kind of beat you up to get you to do what they want you to do. But he was also humane. Um, we loved him. The dancers absolutely loved him. The dancing was really hard. He acquired an enormous amount of stamina. Uh, he did a lot of lifts, very acrobatic lifts that were very hard to learn. Um, and then, you know, had to be performed, eight, you know, eight times a week. It was a hard physical experience, tough on the body. I was very young, so I didn't really feel it until a few years later um, when my knees really started to be shot. And I realized probably had a lot to do with the, that work I was doing on that show. Um, but, you know, that's that's part and parcel of the job. But um, he also, his movement vocabulary, he was worked similarly to DeMille in that he had a very specific style. You could see, you know, you know it's Michael Kidd when you see it. You know it's Agnes DeMille. You know it's Bob Fosse. You know, that's not true of Robbins. You know, Robbins was a, was a chameleon. You can't quite tell his choreography as well. Um, so that was interesting to me to see what the style was and then how he adapted the style to different moments in the show um, was very interesting. And then just his structure, the structure of his numbers were you know, beautiful you have, the way they built. Do you have a, 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 not to denigrate someone by comparison, but do you have a favorite choreographer of today? Is, is it Stroman? Mm. Is it Bill T. Jones? Who? who? Mm. Well, I think Bill T. Jones is terrific. I think what he did with Spring Awakening was really groundbreaking. I, I loved that. And I love what Stephen Hoggett does. You know, it's very, very different kind of choreography than Broadway is used to. It's based in improvisation um, and um, physical, you know, movement, um, physical practice. So both of them I love, but I also love Andy Blankenbuehler and Chris Gatelli and um, Lauren Lataro, I think is terrific. There's so many great choreographers out there right now. Oh boy. See, if, if you were to, to corner, as, as we kind of have in our conversation, an audience member from, let's go back to Podunk, Iowa, and then say, okay, you're going to a Broadway show, maybe for the first time. What, what would you tell them to look for and to get out of the dance in that show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's I I always would like audiences to think, why are the people dancing? What's this dance doing in this moment? So while the point of these numbers is often just to sit back and have fun and enjoy the exuberance that's happening on the stage, I would ask audiences to pay a little closer attention to what is exactly happening. Why is it there? What's the story it's telling? And to take careful note of the movement in terms of, you know, even broadly, you know, is it ballet? Is it modern dance? Is it, you know, um, Sergio Trujillo, who is, you know, fantastic with, you know, any, any kind of dance, um, you know, What's he doing with the different, you know, he, he's going from Jersey Boys to a show that um, has enormous amount of Latin dancing in it, all different kinds of shows, hands on a hard body, which the entire show was done with one hand on a car. I mean, these choreographers are so skilled in versatility of what they can do with dance. Um, Camille Brown, who's fantastic and who's really hot right now, um, I'm always interested to see what she's going to do with her choreography because she does have so much of a, she has a, a wide, um, span of, of ability. 
um, and how she approaches a period piece. She did a cabin in the sky, which there are some numbers in there that are kind of based in like 1940s Lindy, and how she adapted her movement style to that movement style and brought a real choreographer's take on it so that you're not just seeing a plain old Lindy, you're being surprised all the time and leaning in all the time on what she's doing with movement that's engaging you. So, you know, that's, that's I guess I just would love that people would look at it a little more carefully and not just as, oh, it's another dance like every other dance I've seen before. Now, speaking of Lindy, I hope you all will go out, I'm sorry about that, will go out and buy the book by our guest, Liza Gennaro, Making Broadway Dance from Oxford University Press. You can get it on Amazon, you can get it wherever, and it's a Kindle, I'm sure, as well. But, but, Liza, the sad part is that ooh, I have to go. I've had this, this wonderful time talking with you. You do not have to go. You're sticking around because you're going to be hanging with a couple of theater critics. Oh, you're right. Uh, but they're, they're wonderful people. There's David Sheward and Leslie Hoban Blake, who will be playing the Today Yesterday trivia quiz. It's stupid. It's pointless. It's ridiculous. You'll love it. So stick around. Now, and you can even dance. I'm going to play a little klezmer music as we wait for Dave to come back to the show. But thank you so much, Liza Gennaro. Don't go away. Nobody go away. Nobody go away. We got people coming in. Everybody, horror! dancing fool here today everybody on this very wonderful episode of Dave's Gone By featuring our new friend of the neighborhood choreographer Liza Gennaro and our very longtime friend now of the neighborhood theater critic former head of the drama desk David Sheward former managing editor of Backstage and uh, also he's the current theater critic for theaterlife.com uh, culturaldaily.com, and he has a blog called The David Desk. So, Liza, this is your chance. Is there anything you've always wanted to tell a theater critic? <laughs> <laughs> now's, now's your shot. Um, okay, wow, that's intense. Um, no, Stop I invading think... Ukraine. <laughs> I don't think there is anything I want to say. <laughs> well, what is the best? Uh, I'll ask you, Liza. What's... My wife is saying academics are used to criticism, but but what is the best advice or when you read a piece of criticism, either about your work or another choreographer's work uh, that you took to heart that was like, oh, that was perceptive. I didn't notice that. Well, reading about myself, I have always said the good reviews are as damaging as the bad reviews. So it's best to just not read them. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Sorry, David. My own, oh, my, own, my own reviews, I don't. I try not to read them because they, they just don't help me one way or another. Um, when I read other reviews, you know, of course, given my, you know, interests, I do love when they focus on the dance and when they explore the dance as, you know, what is it actually doing within the context of the show? Um, and that's, you know, I mean, I'm sure critics, they only have so much space and time and there's a lot to cover, but I'd love to see more talking about the dances and musicals. Right. Well, David Short, welcome back to the neighborhood. How are you doing? You. Won our, our, we handily won the quiz last week. How has uh, your week been downhill or uphill since then? Uh, that was the highlight. Uh, uh -huh. Well, I had this week off because it's President's Day week. So I I'm, did not have to go to my teaching job this week. And uh, I was able to write my review of The Music Man. Um, mm. And in which interesting, uh, uh, and I explored the dance aspects of it in that in that review. Um, I thought Warren Carlyle did a did a very good job. I thought dan the dancing in it was was quite wonderful. Did and you, oh, I, I was going to ask Liza, have you seen the music? I haven't Carlyle? seen. Okay. I haven't seen it yet. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, and I posted that the uh, changing of the lyrics of Shapoopy is number two on CNN in their news coverage after the invasion of Ukraine. <laughs> oh my 
Yeah. Go figure that Shapoopy would be a number two. But anyway, <laughs> that's the kind in, of... In some markets, it's number one, you know. Well, there you go. We let, Let's, since Leslie isn't here yet, surprise, um, Leslie Ovan Blake will be joining us also for the quiz. Uh, she is a theater director, has been for many years, and she's also a theater critic from Critics Circle. The, um, uh, the you just, my well, Android just said, what would you like to try, a song quiz or today's daily quiz? I think we'll go with today's daily quiz because it's it's a work. So, um, Liza has not played the game yet. So let me explain is the rules are basically pretty simple uh, because I'm basically a simpleton. So here's the deal. It's a trivia quiz. There's three rounds of questions. Each of our three, hopefully contestants gets one question. Uh, the question is worth two points. If you get it right. If you get it wrong, no penalty, but one of the other contestants gets to ticket. steal. Yeah. <laughs> you get to, if, you're, if you're really wrong, you get a one-way ticket to Kiev. But <laughs> I'm like joking there. Um, so, and then, and that's really kind of it. We have a tiebreaker, which we play anyway, um, whether or not it, there's, the score's actually tied, just for having the fun of the questions. Um, you will need, at some point, just to grab a writing implementing a piece of scrap paper for our tiebreaker that's all uh and i will ask you liza new friend of the neighborhood if you had to pick a number between one and six and tell me what it is what would it be four liza with a four david Sheward, what should, what number would you choose three david Sheward with a three interesting okay so we're going to Make believe that Leslie is coming, but late, and, and get things started. So here's I'm going. What Liza doesn't know is I have a virtual die rolling web thing. Ooh. So I'm going to roll the die, and it comes up a one. I was going to just hold on. This just takes forever. Okay. <laughs> uh, a three. David Sheward. The die came up three. So you get to choose. Would you like to be first, second, or third? Uh, I'll be second. David Schwartz, second. Okay. Um, and Liza, I'll, do you want to be first or third? <laughs> well, the, the whole thing makes me extremely nervous because I'm bad at quizzes and tests. So I'll be, it doesn't matter. I could be first or third. <laughs> it's not going to make me feel better either way. Well, what, why don't you see how it works? I'll, I'll put you third. Great. <laughs> well, if Leslie's not here. Right. So you, but at least David will get to answer the first question. And, and I'll be first. first okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and as, as my wife reminded me, Liza, honestly, there are people who come and play the quiz. They, they get no points. It's so, it, there's not, it's not about real knowledge. It's not about it's fun anything, uh, at all. <laughs> it's just my idiocy. <laughs> yeah, you can make fake answers. Um, anytime you don't know the answer, you can just uh, say making Broadway dance as your answer. That will work. <laughs> so... Um, I wonder if I have any of Liza's shows on my pajamas. Oh, I wonder. Wow. That's great. Well, maybe not on Broadway, but certainly she's choreographed everywhere, so you probably do. What are some of the musicals on there? Or maybe uh, in his posters. He's Beauty and the Beast, The Producers, Les Mis, Jersey Boys, Aida, Tarzan, The Color Purple, Annie. No, Annie, Annie must have. Yeah. My father did Annie, but ah. I, and I did the tour, so ah. that's a good one. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I know I know you did Most Happy Fellow, right? Yes, mm -hmm. the one with Jerry Gutierrez, yeah. Mm. So yeah, thank you. My my darling wife uh, brought me a, a beverage. So I'm all set. We're all set. The other, the only other thing you really need to know, Liza, even though the first question goes to David, is that the idea of the quiz is called Today Yesterday. So all of these questions, except a couple that are related to current events, are things that happened on this date. February 26th in history. And so that's, that's how it sort of all ties together. David, are you ready for your very first question? Yes. Of the to get quiz? yes. That, there we go. Oh, wait. Um, also, just, I, I think, I hope I have a text from Leslie. <laughs> what happened? No, you're, no, you're not. Um, what happened? Um, Leslie is saying that she's in the waiting room. Uh, she's saying, is Putin blocking her? I don't know. I, no, <laughs> that's me. Oh, that was you. Oh, that was me just Sorry, a few minutes ago. Well, you're here. Uh, so welcome, Dan. You ready for your first question? Yes. The year was 1266. Oh. The battle is on. Well, you, you remember 1266. The Battle of Benevenuto. Oh, sorry. No, forgive me. The Battle of Benevento in southern Italy. P 
campaign Manfred of Sicily against Charles I of Anjou. Charles would win and establish the Capetian House of Anjou that would influence Southern Europe throughout the Middle Ages. Of course Speaking of Anjou, according to HarryandDavid.com, which of these is false about pears? Okay. See, this, this is where we go, Les. This is, this is how this works. A, oh, Harry and David. Oh, you don't watch HLN, do you? They're, they they bo- package and box like candy. Oh, okay. Yeah, a, g- a gifty kind of foodie oh, okay. thing. Okay. So according to them.com, which of these is false about pears? False about pears. Okay. A, all commercially grown pears are actually picked by hand. B, both Albrecht Dürer and Giovanni Bellini have paintings of Mary and Jesus and a pear. C, the English idiom for failure, going pear-shaped, derives from rural farmers who had to discard apples that weren't perfect looking enough to sell at market. Or D, in Korea, farmers put plastic molds around growing pears so they'll grow shaped like a Buddha. Okay. Oh. One of these, only one of these is false. Oh, okay. Uh, which one is false? Well, they all sound... Now, I've never heard the expression going pear-shaped. I mean, maybe it's from before my time. I don't know. I've never heard that expression. So I'm going to say C. Is that your final yeah. answer? What the hell? C. <laughs> yeah, this, this is the, uh, the budget for this show pays for this. Uh, <laughs> David Sheward, for the wrong reasons, you got the right answer. Oh, well, that is, it was letter C, by the way. Uh, David Sheward on the point, uh, on the board, of course, with two points. Pear shaped is like an English expression where things go south and they go wrong. I didn't know that either. Never heard it. Yeah, oh, never really? heard wow. It. Uh, but it did not come from the farmers and their apples and all of that. It probably came from World War II RAF fighters in training who are trying to fly loop-de-loops, but couldn't finish perfect circles. And so oh. they get sort of this and they get all pear-shaped. Oh. And that's why the British say it. Right, yeah. And I, 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 that expression has been around for a while. Never By the heard way, it. Bellini's painting, Madonna of the Pear, is actually a mm-hmm. quince. Uh, and Dürer has a painting of baby Jesus holding the top of a pear in his hand. So oh. that is actually, actually true. David Sheward on the board with two, count them, one, I just counted them. Yeah. Two points. Nothing from Leslie. Oh dear. I guess. I guess. Uh, you know. Maybe I did. Uh, maybe I missed Noel Coward's great comedy, Pear Shaped, which was a huge hit. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, I love that show. Hello, Cecily. Everything's going all pear shaped now that my uh, marriage has gone up in smoke. You are right, N- Nigel. Pour me a cocktail. Yeah, Michael Kidd choreographed. It was kind of like, oh, anyway, okay. um... <laughs> musical, pear shaped. <laughs> it could work. Now, Liza Gennaro, are you ready for your very first question? Sure. Yeah. Don't be, please don't be nervous. But you look at what show you're on. Do not be nervous. Silly fun. <laughs> the year was 1770. What? Yeah, you, you look, considering that, that, you know, he's wearing pajamas, you're wearing clothes. You're already one up on the game here. God knows what Leslie will be wearing if she ever shows up. The year was 1773. Okay. Uh, Not a musical, three years before the music. The state of Pennsylvania included construction of the Walnut Street Jail, which would become the first prison to experiment with solitary confinement. 30 years later and three blocks away, the Walnut Street Theater would spring up. The oldest continually, excuse me, continually operating theater in the United States. No, this one to Liza. Which of these is false? About the Walnut Street Theater. Oh, I thought you were going to say it's false about walnuts. No, oh, that <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, you're, you're just cracked. A, the theater's original name was The New Circus. B, a streetcar named Desire had its pre Broadway tryout there. C, it was the first American theater to install air conditioning. Or D, a 2019 production of Shrek the Musical was the first time the theater hired a black director. Shrek, it was a musical, yeah. Um, which of these is not true? Could you say them one more time? Absolutely. About the Walnut Street Theater. A, the theater's original name was The New Circus. B, a streetcar named Desire had its pre-Broadway tryout there. C, it was the first American theater to install air conditioning. Or D, a 2019 production of Shrek the Musical 
was the first time the theater hired a black director. I'm just going to say B. Just going to say B. That streetcar named Desire had is, is not true. That streetcar had its tryout somewhere else. Right. Final answer? Yes. <laughs> Oh, I was so filled with desire for you to get this right, but I'm afraid that is not <laughs> the correct. It really did have its, its tryout in Philly oh. at the Walnut Street. So, David Seward, you have a skill opportunity. Okay. From Pennsylvania, so. Right. So. All right. You're, you're from PA, right? Originally? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I actually did a, a show in the, at the Walnut Street Theater once. Like uh, theater. Yeah, yeah. What show? Well, uh, they had a little studio space up on the fifth floor. And uh, we did a, a non-equity production of Kennedy's Children. And I played one of the characters in the bar. I didn't know, I never knew you were acting. Or, and Liza, have you ever uh, choreographed at? I never did work at Walnut Street. Mm -mm. And I saw many shows there. I saw John Glover do Hamlet uh, mm -hmm. there. And uh, Roberta Maxwell did H Hedda Gabler. And uh, see, I would have switched. I would like to see Roberta Maxwell do Hamlet and John ah, do um, again. And uh, Robert Prosky and his sons did the price there. Oh, wow. uh, I'm gonna say D because I think that uh, that wouldn't have been the first black director. I think they they're 2019 is too recent. I think there would have been many black directors before that. Is that your final answer? Yes, yes. Well, David Sheward, you're, you're taking some interesting directions today. Here's the deal. Once again, you got the question right for the wrong reasons. Oh. So you get two more points on the board. You're up for it or nothing. Don't worry, Liza. It doesn't, nothing, none of this <laughs> matters. But here's, this is, no, this is the messed up part. Um, Shrek was directed by Glenn Casal or Casal. Do, do you know him? Um, to date, Walnut Street Theater has, still has not employed a black director. Yeah. Oh. That has the Walnut Street is in a lot of, uh, you know, their their guy who's been running it for forty years is really. Uh, oh yeah, he's been under a lot of whatever for the culture there. So really, that's weird. Yeah, I know that's the yeah yeah. Um, because I saw ceremonies in Dark Old Men in like the nineteen seventies, and I think it was at the Walnut Street Theater, and I'm pretty sure that had a black director. Oh, maybe well, it was a well, tour, well, or maybe, maybe musicals. I'm not. I'm. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, maybe it was a tour. Yeah. And if you're if you're not counting tours, if you're only counting shows that are at the Walnut Street Theater originally and they'll go anywhere, then maybe. Yeah. But I, I distinctly remember seeing Douglas Turner. No, it was Lonnie Elder wrote that play, and Douglas yeah. Turner Ward played the lead. Huh. I want you know what I don't know. Maybe maybe touring shows it doesn't count. Okay. Um, for you, I'll have to. Uh, putting asterisks next to, to that question. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, just so you know, do you know when they put in air conditioning in the Walnut Street? In the 70s? Oh. Yeah, no, but 1855, they had air conditioned theater. That's oh, 1855. 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, they figured out a way to cool. Th maybe I'm, I'm on a very messed up website. Not electric <laughs> information. Well, maybe tubs of ice and they would have people go like this. Yeah, they just blow on the ice, like, yeah. yeah. Anywho. Um, Where's Leslie? Leslie, I have not heard from her. I don't know what's going on with her. So what we're going to do is re recalibrate the thing and just do it one, two, one, two, one, two. So we'll okay. rounds like that. I guess we'll skip. We won't turn the tiebreaker into a tiebreaker. It'll just be another question. So David Sheward, you're up four to nothing. You can go up six to nothing if you get this next okay. question correct. The okay. year was 1859. On this date, before Bobby Fischer, before Gary Kasparov, there was Paul Morphy, American chess whiz. On this date, he began a match with British chess master Augustus Mongredian. Oh, no. Hold on one moment, folks. Is that last one? People, yeah. Let me remind people that you're watching Dave's Gone By. With me, Dave Lefkowitz, we are, uh, we're live on this February 26, 2022. Um, we're oh, she'll, she'll, be in time for, I'm sorry. she'll be in time for the third question. Exactly. exactly. What timing? Hello, Leslie. <laughs> Leslie, we can't hear. Please mute. You can request for her to unmute, David. Request. Oh, oh, she's looking for it. She knows. There we go. Hold on. Oh, oh she's, she's finding it. Hi, good morning. I'm so sorry. You don't even want to know. I'll just, we'll just leave it at you don't want to know. Good morning, David. Leslie. Good morning. Good morning. This is Liza Gennaro, the choreographer. 
Hi. Um, David Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, with her new book, by the way, Making Broadway Dance, which is available oh. from Oxford University Press. Oh, great. It's all about, uh, will you explain, well, you know what, Liza, explain it while Leslie sets herself up. Tell everybody why they should get Making Broadway Dance. And can we get preview copies? Making Broadway Dance. I have a, I have it right here. So I have, <laughs> I have a copy. <laughs> can you see it? Oh, wow. I love the cover. <laughs> it's Gwen Verdon and Peter De Niro, my father. Oh, wow. Are you are, are you, are you Peter's daughter? I am. I, that's so that's so lovely yeah. that and is she, delightful to, she the legacy of it most what? happy fellow the revival uh on broadway and once upon a mattress with sarah jessica parker oh. right, a few years back so oh, right right so um welcome leslie hoban blake leslie very quickly can you pick a number between one and six six okay leslie with a six um oh my god we have two l's this is going to be I'm have you guys have... just been vamping until i got here no, yeah, we've no, gone we've ahead. Gotten two questions, literally. You're, you're third. Oh, you're third. We're um, not going to so wait. Leslie, and what's the score so far? Uh, yes, a wild guess. Four nothing, David. Uh, yeah, big shock. No, no offense, Liza, but it's just it's David. <laughs> what do you just call it? a David Sheward Memorial trivia game? <laughs> and 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 then we can and we can just all watch him answer questions. <laughs> what my wife is saying? The what? Past two were guesses. I know, David. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we have so so far. If they're on your side of the scoreboard, there you know. <laughs> we have a C and a D. If you're following. Oh, thank that. you. Thank you. Did you explain to Liza why we do that? Sometimes we do that to try and see if there's a pattern, and there usually isn't. Okay. <laughs> usually I do have. I have a question for my wife about academia. No, for no, no, no. So I'm what? Just saying academic, to academic. Academic. To academic. Tell, tell what How long did it take you to write the book, Liza? What classes would you use your book? Well, intro to choreography, intro to theater, even or. Um, what other, what courses are people using or will they be using your book for, Liza? Well, yeah. certainly dance history, obviously. Um, but I think any kind of musical theater history course as well, any kind of choreography class. Um, I think really honestly, general information for musicals as well. I mean, I do cover a lot of shows, although I, I mean, my point is to look at them through the lens of dance specifically. But uh, you get a lot of information about directing as well. I think it's a really good book for directors. But I get the information from David because a friend of mine is the head of the dance department at some place in Arizona. Okay. So I'll I'll send her the info. I'm sure it sounds like something they could they would yeah mm -hmm. they would be interested in. I mean, aside from every, aside from other people as well, if you're talking about that kind of thing, how long did it take you to write? Well, I started it when I was I went to college and grad school very late because I had a performance and choreography career first. I started working as a child, so I just went straight through. Um, so I started it in my grad studies and took me, I would say it took me about 10 years because oh. I didn't, I never like just sat and wrote mm -hmm. a book. I was doing dozens of things along the way. So I kept kind of squeezing it in, but I would say the last five years was really the big push. Oh, that's that sounds about average for that kind of book. I mean, there's a lot of research and whatnot. Well, she's also the dean at the uh, Manhattan School of Music, so that uh, did not know that. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, musical theater. Oh, you know, musical theater um, at um, Manhattan School. Of so let us get back to the quiz, where um, this next question goes to Leslie Albang Blake. All right, are you ready, Leslie? So yes. Yeah, so are we in the second round already? This is the no, this well, is the, the end of the first round. Luckily, you literally jumped in one more minute. You, were, I don't know. What oh, oh, I'm, we're still in the first round. Oh my goodness, yeah, my so sense good. of timing. I'm telling you. Yeah. I had to it's rebuild fun. my desktop. Come on, you know. It's like, okay, let's go. I would. I've taken enough of your time. 1859, Leslie. 1859. I was there. Go ahead. <laughs> before Bobby Fischer, before Gary Kasparov, there was Paul Morphy, American chess whiz. On this date, he began a match with British chess master Augustus Mongredian. Morphy drew the first game and went on to win the next seven and the match. Which of these is false about Paul Morphy? Okay. A, before one match, he was treated for gastroenteritis with leeches. He could barely stand up, but he still won. B, when Morphy's father realized his 10-year-old son's talent, he brought his family to Europe for a month so the boy could have lessons with three chess masters. C, an acknowledged world champion, Morphy retired from competitive chess when he was 22 years old. 
or D, he could play chess blindfolded against eight opponents simultaneously and beat them all. All of these are true except one. So I'm torn between the, the leeches and the retirement. The other two Aren't sounds. Yeah. And a hard place, right? I have the leeches sounds. I mean the the your the um, retirement and the um, I can't read my handwriting. The retirement and the blindfold sound true. No, I'm sorry. The retirement and the gastroenterology sign sound true. And we want what's false, right? Right. We want, we I remember reading about somebody who could play blindfolded about it, but it's probably, as David would say, it's probably about how many people he played blindfolded rather than the fact that he played blindfolded. So I'm going to say that he couldn't play 10 games blindfolded, but he could play blindfolded. So your answer is D. D. Is not correct. He could play chess blindfolded and eight opponents simultaneously and win all those games. Final answer? Except we haven't had an A, so... <laughs> Well, I'm afraid that was not the correct move, Leslie Hoban. Like he could play a, and a lot of chess players do that kind of thing with the, with the blindfolding and it's the, the, in their heads. So here's the deal: we get to roll our virtual die, bum, 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 which comes up a six, but that's because the number. Ah, so what is that dinging thing? We have a one. Hold on. We have a four. Ah, four is. Liza Gennaro. So Liza, you have a chance to steal this question. Um, do you need me to read the... the yeah, I'll read them one more time if you don't mind. The remaining options are uh, A, before one match, he was treated for gastroenteritis with leeches. He could barely stand up, but he still won. B, when Morphe's father realized his 10-year-old son's talent, he brought his family to Europe for a month so the boy could have lessons with three chess masters. Or see an acknowledged world champion, Morphy retired from competitive chess when he was 22 years old. One of these is false. I'm going to say A. You're going to say A before one match, the leeches, the gastroenteritis, all of that. Final answer? Mm -hmm. Well, just like leeches, that sucks because that is not the correct answer. David Sheward, uh-oh, you have a chance to get two more points. Okay, so what year was this in again? This this guy, Marpole? On eight, this date in 1859, he began a match uh, okay. against another master. Yes. Okay. Uh, read the whole question, just in case. Of course. Uh, before Bobby Fischer, before Gary Kasparov, Paul Morphy, American chess whiz, on this date he began a match with another chess master, he drew the first game and won the next seven and the match. Which of these is false about Paul Morphy? B, right. when Morphy's father realized his 10-year-old son's talent, he brought the family to Europe for a month so the boy could have lessons with three chess masters. Or C, an acknowledged world champion, Morphy retired from competitive chess when he was 22 years old. I'll say C. And say... So he, he didn't retire when he was 22. Yeah, I'll say C. Well, I'm going to retire from this question. The champion, I have stumped you all. Oh. Nobody gets any points. The truth was that, yes, he did retire. He was only 22. Um, yeah, I'll tell you the whole story. It was And the thing about the incorrect thing was the Europe stuff. Morphe was self-taught. He watched other people just play games, and he just oh. learned. He was one of those genius chess oh. people. Sounds a little like uh, Mozart. Yeah. He was a genius, he, genius, yeah. He was old, you know, when he was started doing it. <clears throat> FYI, he retired from chess and wanted to become a lawyer, but potential clients would come to see him, and all they wanted to do was talk about chess because he was such a famous thing for, for um, and his family was independently wealthy. So even though he gave up chess, he gave up law, didn't matter. He just, he just had a really good life anyway. But we have a, a good game going. We have David Sheward in front with four points, and then nobody else on the board yet. But of course, that can change as we move to, let's see, this would be um, David's question directly, because we begin the second round of our Today Yesterday quiz. So David, you can get two more points here. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. 
The year was 1891. Uh. Only a month after its premiere in Munich, Henrik Ibsen's drama Hegge Gabler, I think we just mentioned that, opens in his native Norway. I never liked Hegge Gabler, but I do like ducks and geese, so which of these is false about gobblers? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. A, the oldest goose in captivity lived just shy of 50 years. B, some police stations in rural China use flocks of geese as guards. Um, C, early bocce balls were made by sewing the webbing from the feet of ducks and geese around compressed clumps of dirt. Or D, chimney sweeps in Victorian England would throw geese down chimneys to see how dirty they were. Huh. Which of these is false, huh? Which of these is false about gobblers? So the oldest, well, gobblers meaning geese, right? Geese or ducks, yeah, but yeah. Okay, so the oldest duck is lived to be 50. In China, they use geese as guards for prison, was it? Uh, in China, some police stations in rural China use flocks of geese as guards. Uh, bocce balls are made out of, certain bocce balls are made out of, uh -oh. Made out of web footing, the web in their footing. Victorian, Victorian chimney sweeps would throw geese down the chimneys to see how dirty they get. Oh, I can't see I that. Chimney sweep with us. Uh, yes. There he is. Yeah. Where's my geese, love? I need a geese to throw down the chimney. I don't think that's how would they get it back up? You know, you throw it down and it's going to get stuck. It comes out down the bottom, whether it's Oh. Or not. Ah, okay. I, I just just I, helping you there. Well, okay. suit yourself. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let's see. We have a C, a B, and a D, but that's no that's no help. Um, I think that geese around as guards, bocce balls. Hmm. Huh. I'm gonna say so. I didn't realize, well, Le Leslie sort of made D more plausible, so I don't think it's D. And it's entirely possible that they would use geese as guards, you know, because they'll honk if somebody gets out of their cell. Um, and a 50-year-old goose, I'll say the bocce balls, C. You'll say it is not true that at one point they made bocce balls by sewing the webbed feet of yeah. geese and ducks around clumps of dirt. Is that right. your final answer? Yes. Well, David Sheward, you are certainly having a ball here on the Today Yesterday quiz on Dave's Gone By. You just got yourself two more points. Oh, I made okay. that up. That's really sick that this one would take yeah. you know, It sounded very plausible to me. <laughs> it really did, given, given the country in which you're talking. What country was it? Sorry? What country was it supposed to be? I thought he said China. I didn't, I didn't say a, a country. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he said where China. Where there were guards. Yeah, China the guard thing, because you're right. Of the honks, right, right, right. I thought it was all China. Honks, they all start going at it. Bocce balls have been made of wood, clay, metal, or plastic, uh, but not duck's feet. Although early golf balls were stuffed with goose feathers. So that's oh. kind of You know, I think that uh, the musical I was talking about with uh, called Pear Shaped, which Lies is going to choreograph. Yeah. There should be a number with a whole chorus line of chimney sweeps holding their geese. And they can do a little, a little dance step and then throw them down the chimneys. <laughs> and they'll come out all dirty and they'll say, look at me, I'm all dirty now. Oh, I missed all the really good stuff. You know, it, I would think the geese on the, the gut ducks and the geese on the water, I live on the Hudson and they kept me sane for the first year of the pandemic. I would go out and I would feed them and they were extremely calming and then I find out you're not supposed to feed them bread and they can get very sick. This I did not know. So I stopped feeding them, but I would still go visit them. Oh. Now they don't come, they didn't come back this year. You were supposed to feed them fettuccine Alfredo. They love that. This is cheesy, but it's gotta be hot. They, they like it that way. Anyway, Liza, <laughs> I'm gonna wipe that smile off your face because guess what? Your question after this is one of our different ones. We call this Three I'm sorry, David, what was that last letter? Oh, I'm sorry. It was um, C. C was the correct it's answer. C. So we have C, D, B, C. C oh, Thank you. Hold on. Hold on. There we go. Um, Liza, one thing that we do a little differently is that some questions we call three clues in the news. And um, what it has to do with is three words or names 
that are not connected to each other, okay? Uh, but they seem random, but each word is connected to the word that we're looking for, okay? So for example, where's my usual one about, um, if I were to say sweet couch vegetable, your answer might be, those three words aren't connected to each other. What word like blank, sweet blank or blank sweet, couch blank or blank couch? <laughs> What's the third one? Or, or vegetable is a? Uh, potato. Sweet potato, couch potato, potato is a vegetable. So all those words are not connected to each other. They're connected to potato. That's how Three Clues in the News works. And there is a little bit of a hint because um, the word that you're looking for is in some way related to something that's happened in the world this past week in the news. Are you ready? <laughs> I feel like I'm living my nightmare of having, to be, having to be on NPR with Will Short. <laughs> <laughs> and no matter what time of day I turn the radio on, it seems that Will Short is on doing the puzzler, which is my nightmare in life. So, okay. You don't, you, do, you don't do Wordle? The puzzle. <laughs> I'm dyslexic, and this is like really difficult. So, let's just go for it. Yeah. So I can choreograph all your dances in reverse, and so that no, I have no, you know, no spatially. I'm fine. <laughs> so here's the deal: where I'm going to name. There are going to be three clues, words, or names, and we're looking for a word or a name. Ready? Count. Count. Mm -hmm. Collins. Uncle. Collins, like spell it, C O C O L L I N S. N -S. Uncle. I don't have a clue. Um, well, I've given you three clues. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a clue in my head. The answer is making Broadway dance. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's what you gotta do. Local from Oxford University Press. <laughs> so, do you, do you want to just pass, or do you want to just say I'm making pass? Dance? Okay, no problem. You'll see how this goes. And, and it's a tough one. I'm, I'm not going to say this is an easy, <laughs> not going to be easy. Um, I'm going to roll the die and we're going to see what comes up. And we come up with a one. I'm going to roll the die again. We come up with a four. That sounds familiar. Who has four? Oh, Liza does. We're sorry. Um, we're going to come up with a six. Leslie Hoban Blake, would you like to try? This? No, I wouldn't like to. I'll, I'll, I'll make a stab at it, but I wouldn't like to at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I immediately went for Tom, but that doesn't work with count. And remember that the answer is something connected to the news. I mean, all I can think of is this fucking war. So, you know, that's... Uh, this fucking My brain is not the answer. Um, yeah. No, I know. I'll, I'll go with Tom. That's the only word that came. Okay. Final answer? Yeah. Ah, well, maybe tomorrow that would be the correct answer, but time uh, is not today. I couldn't do a pun on that. David Sheward, you have a steal opportunity. You can well, put like eight points on the board here. Okay. I was going to say Tom also because that's the only thing I can think of that connects Collins and Uncle. Uh, so this, uh, the only other thing I think of is Sam or Michael, but how does count fit into this? Um, count, count, count. Uh, there's, but there's no uncle. I'm sure somebody has an uncle Michael, but, uh, I do actually. And, uh, who is Sam Collins? Sam, uncle, uncle. Uncle. Oh, maybe uncle. cry, cry, uncle, cry, Collins, cry, count, 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 Alma Viva. Uh, uh, my, so it's Michael or Alma Viva uh, or Dracula. Uncle Dracula. Hey, Uncle Dracula. Yes, nephew. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'll be funny and say Alma Viva. And is that 
your answer? No, let me make, I'll say, I'll say Sam. Sam is my final answer. Sam is your final answer. Sam is my final answer. Now, uh, no barber of Seville, haircut for you. I'm afraid none of, nobody got the answers. This was indeed a tough one. The word we were looking for, Count Collins, Uncle Floyd. Oh! Count Floyd from oh. Super TV, Uncle oh. Floyd. Oh, okay, that's Collins. real obscure. Yeah, and no, Floyd Collins is hardly obscure, but I, I wasn't thinking. Well, to an that. average person walking down this, to us, maybe it's not, but exactly. to the average you civilian guys, walking yeah. down the street, they'd say, who's that? Right. Yeah. So, and then, of course, George Floyd was in the news. Right. Week, they right? they uh, they got those three guys last this week. Yeah. Oh, I, the, I, uh, the other police, the other policemen. Right. So, all right, we make it through that question. I told you, Liza, these, these are not easy. I thought they're, they're... Well, I didn't think of Count Floyd. Yeah, so I, mean, well, I almost did it. I, I, almost, it. I was sort of doing the voice, kind of. Yeah. All right, no problem. We move on. David is still uh, six points on the board. No one else on the board yet, but that can change. I just want to make David look good. <laughs> okay, Liza, we girls have to put our thinking caps on now. Can't let him. Can't let him. We won't. Maybe not win, but it can't be a. It can't be a, a route, right? There we go. Yeah. There we okay. go. Leslie O'Ban Blake, this is on you. You can get two points here. Are you ready? The year was 1933. Ground was broken today on what would become the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. So which of these is false about that iconic structure? A, in 2005, traffic on the bridge came to a halt when an alpaca broke out of a cargo van and began wandering around for 20 minutes before being captured. B, when the bridge was first painted, the orange color was just supposed to be primer before the real colors were chosen. C, when the bridge opened in 1937, the toll was a pricey 50 cents each way, or in its history, and what year was what year was that? 1937. When the bridge was opened in 1937, the toll was a pricey 50 cents each way, or D, in its history, the bridge has been closed only twice for visiting dignitaries FDR and Charles de Gaulle. One of these is false. I think 50 cents in, in 37, which was still the depression, was like an incredible amount of money. So I think that's got to, that jumps out at me right away. The, the rest of them make sense one way or another. I mean, the alpaca doesn't make sense, but it's so stupid, it's probably true. Um, <laughs> and we haven't had an A. And 50 cents is C, so that would make three Cs. But last week he did that to us. I'm going to say that it's false and it costs 50 cents. Is that your... <laughs> yeah, that's the one that really jarred me when you read it. And Liza is agreeing with me. I can see that, yes. Well, I don't like that answer one bit or two bits. No, how much is a bit? Is that... Uh, is that that's a quarter, a I think. Yeah, so... Four bits is 50 cents, so two bits is 20. Oh, two bits is a quarter, okay. No, it was uh, so like 13 and a half cents. Thank, thanks, Dave, I didn't know that. But anyway, Leslie, guess what? It was exorbitant for the time, but it really was 50, so it was like equivalent to $9.50. So time. only rich people could go across the bridge? Yeah. Everybody else had to swim? What? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, it was, I'm, that's the wrong answer, I'm afraid, but it really was 50 cents when it opened back in 1937. I'm gonna roll the die. And let's see what comes. I take umbrage. Go ahead. Well, yeah, keep me some umbrage. Can you just that say, was a joke. Bridge. And I used the word bridge, and I thought somebody would at least raise an eyebrow. Nothing. Oh. Nothing. Crickets. Okay, never mind. I'm going to raise an eyebrow here. Thank you. Yes. Well, David, we lower go. your eyebrow because you have a question to answer. Okay. I'll just roll the three. So which of these is false about the, the Golden Gate Bridge? Right. An alpaca wandered around. Uh, the the color, the orange color was supposed to be primer and they just left it. And it's only been closed twice for FDR and De Gaulle. Is right. that right? Twice for dignitaries. It's uh, been closed for other reasons, but the only time it's been closed for dignitaries is FDR and Charles De Gaulle. Well, um, you know, uh, this is a crap. And I have four points. You have six. Oh, I have six. Oh. Yeah, Lord, you're over us. Yes, yes, you have six. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, oh, I forgot I had six. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was thinking about the you know the new musical we're going to do called Pear Shaped. Um, let's see, and, and oh, because somebody there. already did six, I know. And there's, and there's so in addition to the number with the chimney sweeps and the geese, there'll be a number where an alpaca gets loose. Wow. And it can be in like a like they do in the music man. Every Jerry Zach's musical now has a horse costume. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Well, the alpaca one will be wild and woolly. But yes. Yeah. So when he does, it's hammer, be really hard when he does death of a salesman. But yeah, go ahead. Does, there'll be a fake horse. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. So alpaca primer or twice close. Um, hmm. Hmm. Could be any one of these. Uh, I'll say D that there were other dignitaries who it was closed for. Is that your final answer? Yes. Well, as is the motto of this show, dignity, always dignity, but not dignitaries. That is the wrong answer. Liza Jamar, you can get on the board with a steal opportunity here. What might you say? Well, I thought that I did hear about the orange primer when I was in San Francisco many moons ago. So I thought that was true. So I'm going to say false is the alpaca A. Is that your final answer? Yeah. You're going to Disneyland because I'll pack a suitcase for you. That is the correct answer. Yes, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Gennaro on the board. We're always getting really excited when a newbie gets some points. Yes, Liza. Um, that was not true. That did not happen. I'll tell you what did actually happen. Um, a few years ago, an ostrich got loose. Um, it smashed out of a, a van that accelerated. The ostrich just started wandering around the bridge. They had it closing off. People were taking pictures. Um, and ironically, what's great is that alpaca had just been um, saved from a meat farm. The guy was, was going to bring it on a farm. And, the and ostrich, you mean? The, the ostrich. The ostrich? Yeah, okay. The ostrich, and he was going to have it make baby ostriches, going to use it as a stud. Oh. And the, the ostrich just went out of the van and then there's great pictures of it it's, it's wonderful that that sounds like a bugs bunny cartoon or something yeah true it's absolutely everybody you can go google it just go ostrich golden gate bridge and it, it just happened a few years ago so but yay liza on the board with two points uh but you're still behind congratulations me. <laughs> Thank you. so we go into the third round of our today did i get my third question oh that was my third question was your third question yeah that so, was my question. Okay, sorry. We go now back to David Sheward, though, okay. who's, who's already got six points, so a formidable opponent. And David Sheward, you get our next three ah. times in the news. Oh, oh, here we go. Okay. So we all know how this works now. I'm going to have three names or words yeah. pointed to another name or word. Are you ready? Yes. Note. Note. Monster. Monster. Up. Up. Got to be Mash. Is that your final answer? I was going to say Vladimir, but it's Mash. Or, well. Mash. The most hated word in the dictionary. <laughs> it is. It is indeed David Sheward. Two points on the board. You just, wow, like that. You got was monster. Did, is that the one that took it for you? Well, it, it, I figured, what can note be? And then you said Matt. You said monster. And I said, what's well, got to be Nash? So and then Nash you're nodding. And so, and oh, do we know why? No. Uh, something happened. Alan Alda uh, died or something? Oh, yeah. Loretta Swift. Oh, no, Loretta no, Swift no, no, died. No, 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 no. She's fine. Uh, Sally Kellerman. The, the oh, Sally uh, Kellerman. I Sally Kellerman. Sorry, Sally same, Kellerman. same oh, for all different actors. Right. Yes. She died on Thursday at the age of 84. So Mash. For yes. Sally Kellerman. Well, boy, oh boy, you are just crushing and mashing this game, David Shu. You have eight points. Yay. I think you're almost at this. I think you are actually unbeatable at this point, but let's just go to the questions anyway. <laughs> as you bask in the glory of your victory. I want to go for the showcase showdown. <laughs> okay. Um, you can go to now you can go to the college bowl, David. <laughs> and I want and I want uh, and I want the big deal of the day. Well, I'll I'll make that happen. But first, I'm going to ask Liza Gennaro a question. Are you ready? Here we go. 
The year was 1956. Two poets are invited to a party in Cambridge and they hit it off. Unfortunately, they're Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath. Which of these was false about posthumous Pulitzer winner Plath? A, her daughter is a poet whose publisher is Blood Axe Books. B, her father was investigated by the FBI for being anti-American. C, the Boston Herald published her first poem when she was eight years old. D, Plath and Hughes chose June 13th as their wedding date because it was the birthday of their mutual favorite poet, William Butler Yeats. Say B again, please. Uh, B is her father was investigated, <clears throat> excuse me, was investigated by the FBI for being anti-American. I'm going to go with B. You're going to say it's not true that her father was investigated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Final answer? Yes. Well, F, B, I'm sorry. That is not the correct answer. So we're going to roll that die. And we're going to come up with a four, which is Liza's number, so that doesn't help us. We're going to come up with a three, uh, which is David's number. David, All here right. you go. This uh, showcase. Right. Yeah. So her daughter is a poet, and she her publisher is Blood Axe Publishing. Mm -hmm. Her first poem was published at when she was eight years old and they chose June 13th because their favorite poet is Yeats. I think, well, I, I, I'm pretty sure she did have a daughter because I remember um, her complaining about having to take care of babies in London. It was the coldest winter ever. And then she put, stuck her head in the oven for warmth or something. I've done that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think she did write poems when she was a little girl. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And, uh, June 13th, hmm. I'm gonna say uh, D, June 13th is not, it, it, that, that, that Yates was not their favorite poet. The final answer? Thing. Yeah, that's my final answer. Well, David, you would make a great date because you've gotten that right. That is the correct, incorrect answer. Two more points for David Schubert on the board with 10. Here's the deal. Um, their wedding date was chosen to be not June 13th, but June 16th, because they wanted it to be Bloomsday uh, ah. from Ulysses. So that's when ah, they got okay. married. Um, her father was investigated by the FBI because he migrated from Prussia just before World War I. So they were worried he would be like pro-German. Ah. Um, oh, that's right. She wrote a poem about that, about her daddy. Right, yeah, it was a pretty famous poem. And here's her, when she was eight years old, the Boston Herald published this, this lovely little thing. Hear the crickets chirping in the dewy grass. Bright little fireflies twinkle as they pass. Doesn't really sound like Sylvia Plath, does it? But that, that was her. And then they all killed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> they exploded. They spontaneously combusted. Yes. <clears throat> and Sexton throws a party, you know. <laughs> Man. So here's one more question. That was funny. <laughs> In our Today and Yesterday quiz before the tiebreaker, my question goes directly to Leslie Hoban Blake. So, Leslie, if you get this, you get on the board. You get two points. You know, you talk about <laughs> there's a there's a word for stuff when you do it, and it's stupid for doing it. I can't oh, think of the word. Lie. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's a word for you, like you know, it doesn't matter whether you do it. It makes no sense. It does. That's what I'm doing now. I can't think of the word though. But go no, ahead. Uh, it's it's pussy pussy Thank you. It's moot. That's the word. Thank you. You're, you're most welcome. So here's a moot question, Leslie O'Ban Blake, to end round three. And guess what? It's our third Three Clues in the News. Oh, I love you dearly for that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ukraine. The answer is Ukraine. Uh, maybe. Maybe. No, U C R A N E. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Here we go. Three words not connected to each other, connected to the way. Rider, old, blue eyes. Ah. 
<laughs> Want to share? When when we're when we're done, in case anybody else wants to try to answer this, I'll I'll, I'll tell you why I'm laughing. You must know why I'm laughing. Um, but I don't know what the word is. Um, okay, I'm just going to share what I'm, my, my my mind is. CC Rider and all blue eyes together is Sinatra. So obviously, so I have no idea where that would go. Yep, blue eyes, blue eyes. Does Putin have blue eyes? The guy that saw, um, from the Ukraine, he had blue eyes, one blue this way, one blue that way, but. <laughs> oh, David, read the room, it's too soon. I know, yes, yes. It's never too soon for a comedian, come on. That's right, that's right. Um, I have no idea. I, I I just I sort of foxed myself because my mind went a certain place and it won't go anywhere else. So that's it. So is your I'll, I'll stick with my zero. I'll wear my goose egg proudly, since I love geese. It's okay. So your answer is making Broadway dance. Is that correct? My yeah. my answer is I'll throw it to I'll throw it to Liza. Making Broadway dance. Absolutely. All right. Well, so I'm going to roll the die because um, it could be either David Sheward or Liza Gennaro who gets the next question. It's the one that comes up. We're looking for either a four or a three, depending. I'm just keeping rolling the die until I get either a four or a three. La, 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 la. And, oh, for God's sakes. Take oh, a dance please. break. David Sheward. Yes. Um, th this question now goes right. to you. Three clues in the news. All Rider. Right. Rider. Ooh. Old blue eyes. Right. Um, uh, it can't be easy because the, it doesn't make sense. Easy blue eyes, old easy. And yeller doesn't make any sense because there's not a yellow rider or yellow blue eyes. Blue eyes. Uh, and Leslie's right. Old blue eyes would be Sinatra. So that would go with that. Old. And it's not paint. Rider. And it's not CC. Rider, 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 hauling, rider, rider, rider to a contract, um, rider, blue eyes, blue eyes and celery, I don't know, um, blue eyes, blue eyes, um, uh, I'm going to say uh, Kiev. Is that your, oh, oh, is it Kiev or Kiev? It's Keeve. Keeve. I'm going to say Keeve. Doesn't matter. Either one would be wrong. So, uh, Liza Gennaro, do you want to try and steal this question and well, then put two more points on the board? I'm happy to say that I ha did have the same thinking as our other two contestants. Um, I'm trying to make easy work. The old blue eyes, I can't figure out how that's not so um, Ghost, isn't there something about a ghost writer? I don't, can't make sense of that. Yeah. So I think I don't have anything. I think that's a comic book or a comic book character, yeah. ghost, ghost Rider. So are you going to... Nick, Nick, Nicholas Cage. Oh. So, Liza, are you going to come up pass. or... You're pass. Or, or just, what's the name of your book? Making Broadway Dance. Making Broadway Dance. There we go. Well, um, I did stump the pass. This, this was a really tough one. But here's the deal. Rider, old, blue eyes. The word we're looking for, pale. Oh, pale. Oh, pale. old pale? Old pale. Very strong. Oh, oh the, the vodka. Oh. Pale. Yeah. Um, pale Rider and Pale Blue Eyes, the Lou Reed song with um, oh. the Velvet Underground. And pale because Gary Brooker uh, co wrote and sang Procol Harum's first hit, Whiter Shake of Pale, and he passed away oh. last week. So. Okay. I know. I know that was a toughie. That that that. You yeah, pulled that one out of your belly button, didn't you, David? I, didn't get, I did sort of see that somewhere out of the corner of my eye, but it wasn't as prominent as Sally Kellerman's passing. So yeah, but they're, they're both tripping alike. Thank you okay. to speak. So, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, we'll... for the record, before we go to a, to the tie, I know it's David's game, I, and I thank you, Liza, for at least not making it a total wreck. <laughs> it's so interesting the letters this week. The first three CBD is what's keeping me sane these days. Oh. And the other three is CAD is CAD. So you've been a terrible CAD to us this week. Thank yeah, you very much. I'm That's sorry. it. 
Leslie, why are you, uh, do you mind sharing why you're using CBD oil? What, what's why you're in pain? Oh, I've been using it for pain. It got me off fentanyl. Oh. Uh, oh. I was, I was on fentanyl. My, my entire body oh, is nothing the CBD but bones. Cad. Yeah. What? Oh, I'm just saying CBD CAD. So that's a. Yeah, yeah so CBD can, CAD. But, but no, but the CBD is, has been exceptionally helpful. It's supposed to keep me calm. It has not helped me this week on that score at all. <laughs> not at all. Okay. Well, um, everybody calm down now because it's time for the tiebreaker. It doesn't mean anything because David Schuert is the winner. Da, 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 da. Yay, David Schuert every week now, almost every week. But, but congratulations, <laughs> David. So. Yeah, David, don't hate the player. No, <laughs> I'm sure Liza hates the David game. has a sort of a, a favorite son thing going on here with David. With David. It's, it's, um, Liza's an Favorite nation, I should say. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a lot. Half of these were guesses, you know. No, they're, they're always like halfway. There's no way. You, there's no it's way very you sweet of you. It's sweet of you to, to be so humble, David. There's no way you can. There's no way you can know this stuff. You know, right. some of this. That's, that's. It used to be more of a when we first started, like two or three years ago, it was more of a like real trivia. Like you, if you knew it, you'd know it. Now it's sort of like what you've got. Well, oh. not only that. Initially, Liza, the day, the things actually happened on the day that we're talking about. Then he just used it as a springboard, and we always got hysterical, like you know, oh, it would be. Uh, uh, and then the, the, the ten things about pizza, you know, it was. It just but, uh, I did pizza. learn that, uh, that my favorite thing today is the chimney sweeps and the geese. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. I'm just picturing that. But it makes so much sense. It's it's such a sensible. Like a chimney sweep with a goose under his arm knocking on the Hello, right. mom. Can I? I check that's exactly chimney? right. In all no. likelihood, it didn't hurt the geese. I hope. Yeah, I guess they just flew right down. They just got dirty. They right. might have coughed a little yeah, bit. They have an agent. They have an agent. Then maybe, maybe some of them got like that lung disease. They're sad. They're sad. <laughs> anyway. They didn't live long enough. Yeah. And then, and okay. then people were actually not paying the chimney sweep. Uh, they would pay the geese. And the geese would just stop putting on my bill. But you know, oh. I'm sorry. Um, oh. Tiebreaker time. So here's how the tiebreaker <laughs> works. Oh, like. my operation. <laughs> um, this is why I had you get a pen and paper, because what we do instead of the typical answer is all three of you will write down the answer. I'll read the question a second time and then I'll go three, two, one, and then you will hold the answer up to the camera so that we can all read it and you can all answer simultaneously. Okay. So are you guys ready for the tiebreaker question? Yes, just like Thumb Jeopardy, yes. The year was 1944. Born today in New York City is this billionaire philanthropist, executive, art collector, and politician, former U.S. ambassador to Austria. He's the president of the World Jewish Congress and could have been mayor of New York had he not been bested by Rudy Giuliani in the primary. Name him. So this is a real trivia question. <laughs> now you missed the messed up ones I write. Yeah. Um, uh, I should know it? this. You read probably again. do. Say it again. Yeah, read it again. <laughs> the year born today in 1944, February 26, 1944. Who was born in 1944. Yes. In New York City is this billionaire philanthropist, executive, art collector, and politician, former U.S. ambassador to Austria. He's the president of the World Jewish Congress and could have been mayor of New York. Had he not been bested by Rudy Giuliani in the primary? Name him. I know who it is. I don't know how to spell it. So, well, it, try. I'm, we're going to take points off for spelling. Although, uh, poor addition, we do. Okay, so, if you. <laughs> I believe he also founded a, a, a museum, but I cannot, I can't remember how to spell his name. Everybody else ready? Yes. I, I have, I got nothing, so I'm putting up. If you misspell it. I'm, I'm putting it up a name, it's going to be wrong, but I know who it is. I just can't, I don't remember how to, what is. It's spelled, it's fine. No, I didn't spell it fine. I think I'm, I think I'm off on a tangent, but I know who it is. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see if Leslie knows who, whether she spells it right or not. 
David, you seem to be somewhat confident. Liza, you'll hold up your book. <laughs> so here's, here's, I'll read the question one more time. I'll give a three, two, one, and then you'll hold up your answers. 1944, born today in New York City is this billionaire philanthropist, executive art collector, and politician, former U.S. ambassador to Austria. He is the president of the World Jewish Congress and could have been mayor of New York had he not been bested by Rudy Giuliani in the primary. Name him three, two, one. I see George Soros. I see Lionel. I can't read your, your. I see Making Broadway Dance, of course. Someone Lerner. Is that Lionel Lerner? Yeah, that's that's as close as I can get. His mother is a famous beautician, and I can't think of her name either. Well, okay. Um, Lauder. Soros. Lauder. Thank you. It's not Lerner. It's Lauder. Thank you. Well, guess I what? Come up Leslie, with was, it, it, it was. It is still alive and running. Is Ron Lauder? Oh yeah. Well, okay. True. And, and he founded the new museum, the Neu Museum yeah. on 86, yeah. which I love. I love that museum. So, Little his, vest pocket museum. His mother is Estee Lauder. Right. Estee Lauder. I mean, I said famous musician. I just couldn't come up with that. My mind just went Elizabeth Arden. You know, it didn't help. <laughs> let's not let's not fight. Let's all make up. Uh. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been playing the Today Yesterday trivia quiz. So I want to thank so much the folks who have been playing it, first of all, and foremost this week, Liza Gennaro, who just held up her book, Making Broadway Dance from Oxford University Press, available wherever books are sold. Liza, are you, what are you directing at um, Manhattan, or I'm sorry, choreographing at uh, Manhattan School of Music? Well, we, we just completed um, Dave Malloy and Kristen Knight's Don't Stop Me. And coming up, we have Sunday in the Park with George, directed by Don Stevenson, and very little dance in it, but I've been working on it as well. And then we have a new show, um, Workshop in Development, called One Way by uh, Christopher Staskel and uh, Ben Bonema. Do you have a favorite Sondheim <laughs> musical? Because we're still all sort of... Do I have reading. a favorite Sondheim? Yeah. Little Night Music, I think, and Sweeney. We did Sweeney a couple of years ago. We haven't done Little Night Music yet, but I'd love to. Uh -huh. Uh, and let me move on to our other uh, wonderful our weekly guests playing the Today Yesterday Trivia Quiz. First of all, Leslie Hoban Blake, uh, you are on the uh, the podcast, the video podcast, Critics Circle with Charlie Gross. It's a, a channel on YouTube. You can watch the most recent episode as well as your previous ones. What is your most recent episode of Critics Circle? The Serena, the Serena Review. It's on YouTube. Okay. Um, and is there going to be another one next? Are you prepping one? Or is I don't know. Right now, as, as you know, Dave, uh, Charlie is very busy working on, on working. So yeah, no muscle. right now, we're not doing anything. So Cool. And David Sheward, you're writing stuff all the time. So you, what reviews of yours can we read in culturaldaily.com and theaterlife.com? Most recently, uh, Intimate Apparel and um, uh, Black No More which has the, one of the best parts of it is its choreography by Bill T. Jones. Okay. I would, which is, it has a very short run, but the, the Bill T. Jones is just, he's amazing. Do you, do you like his work, Liza? I love him, yeah, I saw the he, show last week. So. Oh, wasn't the dancing great? That was the best part of it. Um, and uh, um, The Music Man, I have a review of that, uh, which I thought was, uh, I thought Sutton Foster stole, she was the, the focus of attention. It should have been called Mary and the Librarian instead of the Music mm -hmm. Man. And uh, I just last night saw The Hang by Taylor Mack off off Broadway, which is weird. Uh, so I'll have a heart, I'll write something about that. And tonight I'm seeing English at Atlantic Theater Company slash. So you're back at the theater with a, with a vengeance, eh? Well, it's, it's like, that's like one or two a week. Um, and on my blog, I've been writing about uh, Oscar. I'm trying to see as many of the Oscar nominated films as possible. And uh, so I wrote about that and I just have licorice pizza and drive drive my car. And once I see those, I'll have seen all the best picture. Nominees. Are you gonna go to the movies to see licorice pizza? Cause it's not on TV. Then I'll have to. Maybe they'll send you a link if you show them what you're doing. Maybe. <laughs> yes, of all the short subjects that you've been watching, but watch, I'm sure the animated shorts and the docu shorts. What was your favorite short subject of the year? Uh, well, what I've seen, I really like this. This real cute cartoon called Robin Robin about a little Robin who was adopted by a family of mice. Oh. 
and she thinks she's a mouse. And so they sneak into a house together, but she gives them away. And so she sort of feels rejected and she makes friends with a magpie voiced by Richard E. Grant. And this cat tries to catch them and the cat sounds like Margaret Thatcher because the voice is Gillian Anderson. <laughs> and I'm going to eat you now, darling. <laughs> And it's a very amusing little, it's like a 30 minute and, and it has songs. So it's like a little mini musical. It's very cool. cute. Do they throw him down a chimney and see if he- uh, or Yes. <laughs> that too. And, and is it, does it go pear shaped, Dave Jewett? Sure. Yes. And it's on Netflix. So one can see it. Oh, cool. I'm, I'm going to check that out. Well, it- Fatso it... was on last night, if anybody's interested. Was what that... was? Fatso and Bancroft's oh, and Bancroft's movie with Dom DeLuise. Oh. Wait, I, we just I, when you said pear shape, that's what I thought of. Huh. He, he probably smells very good. I don't know what good morning, you. Joyce. Good morning. Let me thank all of you so much for being with us in the thank day. You. David and Leslie and, and Liza. So Lovely meeting Liza. you, Liza. Yes. We're meeting you Mr. too. Wonderful. If you weren't watching earlier, Liza's conversation with Rabbi Saul was just so informative about dance and so much fun. I'll watch it tomorrow when you put it up on YouTube. <laughs> we will. We will. So have a good one guys. Let's do it. Let's do them. Bye. Look out for our new music. Congratulations, David. Well done. Thank you. Look out for our new musical, Pear Shaped. <laughs> Bye, Dave. Thanks so much. See you Bye -bye. next week. Thank you all. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much, Liza. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.